or were able to get the help that they need, it certainly stops them what happens. It's really too much for me. When I think about what these little kids in middle school, I, this is not even high school, not even middle school, just starting school is there. Your every teacher, that's really changing. You know, and I think the young man who was so busy and taking a lot, especially the help that they need. So we're doing this because we feel it's so important that SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, PASC for short, 
or post-active COVID-19 or COVID, chronic COVID-19, this is what they are referring to when the symptoms last three months or longer. Now, uh, one of the questions that people are interested to know, what impacts and what factors into how long the symptoms will last? How come some people have it for a couple of weeks? Some, how come some people have it up to a year or even longer? So as with any illness, uh, baseline uh, health prior to the infection carries a lot of weight. This includes having serious medical conditions, being in an immunocompromised state, such as uh, chemotherapy, uh, long-standing steroid use, such as uh, people with chronic asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD for short, any sort of debility, and of course, transplant patients. Advanced age is a risk factor, uh, as is pre-existing psychiatric illness, and I will get more into it as, we, as the presentation goes on. And of course, how severe was the experience of the initial COVID-19 infection? Did the person require hospitalization? And if so, did they go to the intensive care unit? Did they uh, need intubation? How long was the hospitalization? Was it a couple of days? Was it a couple of weeks? So that does go a factor into it as well. Were there medical complications during the hospital stay? Was there secondary bacterial pneumonia diagnosed? Was there a venous thromboembolism, also known as a DVT, which can travel to the lung or the brain? Was there kidney damage? So um, the international data that has come in was very interesting in that pretty much the data was consistent. Um, everybody pretty much reported the same thing. So the post-COVID syndrome symptoms that were most commonly reported was brain fog. So what is brain fog? Basically a difficulty concentrating. Um, uh, some examples are you're reading a book, you have to read the page several times, and you're like, I'm not getting this. It's uh, almost slowed down thinking. You have to make an effort to even engage in a conversation. Uh, you exert energy in paying attention to remember things. Um, it takes longer to process information. Along with this, we're also reporting word finding difficulties. Um, it's like, oh, what is that called? And then a couple of minutes later, it, it comes to you. And this was also very commonly reported, uh, as well as memory issues, such as, you know, what exactly was I talking about, or where did I leave? keys, things like that. Now, uh, not surprisingly, depression and anxiety have also been very commonly reported. And um, how can it not, right? Everything that everybody has been through, because it had all, also a physical and also a mental component uh, that continues to exist. And uh, in a couple of minutes, I will dwell into it and what the factors are that really, really brought forth the psychiatric or mental health component of it. Sleep disorders have been commonly also reported worldwide. Difficulty falling asleep, tossing and turning, difficulty staying asleep with frequent uh, awakenings overnight. Um, there has been a decreased uh, satisfaction of the quality of sleep. Like, let's say you slept six hours, but you still feel exhausted. That has been a, a, one of the common reported uh, lasting symptoms as well. Now, interestingly, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, which we often hear about, um, it has a prevalence rate of about 3 to 7% at this time when it comes to COVID-19. It is not as common as people would think. I think it's a terminology that tends to be a little bit overused. Because in fact, when it comes to uh, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual 5, which is basically the Bible of psychiatric disorders and what elements have to be met for us to get the diagnosis, it's not easy to meet the elements. So I did include it so when you hear PTSD, you have an idea of what exactly this disorder is. So the criteria to meet this has to be an exposure to death, threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence to self or somebody in your vicinity. This has to be trauma that the vast majority of people, the average person, would be traumatized by. 
when you sing a car accident, burst into flames, somebody screaming inside, you keep hearing the, that voice. That's a trauma. Now, in addition to this, that there has to be a traumatic event, there has to be intrusive symptoms. And the symptoms can be recurrent distressing memories, recurring nightmares, flashbacks or dissociative reaction where there's the re-experiencing of the trauma, intense or prolonged psychological distress that face of reminders, and physical reactions such as heart racing, um, cold sweat, palm sweaty, restlessness, a general feeling of doom or you're not feeling safe. Now, in addition to these uh, elements, there also has to be some sort of alterations of mood or cognition, such as a memory lapse where you cannot recall certain parts of the traumatic event, uh, almost a detachment where you almost have like a, a wooden appearance and feeling when you have to talk about that event. And of course, there is the hyperactivity or reactivity um, that comes with it, such as irritability, anger, outbursts, hypervigilance. And all of this has to exist for more than one month. So, as you can tell, to meet criteria of PTSD, as per uh, what a psychiatrist would diagnose, is, is not easy. There are quite a few elements you would have to meet. Now, in addition to everything we talked about, a couple of the other neuropsychiatric symptoms that people have reported to prolong even after one year after the infection is shortness of breath after, with exertion, and it doesn't have to be great exertion. Some people are saying, you know, even if I uh, carry my groceries for one block, I start to have exertion. Um, neck and low back pain is commonly reported. Interestingly enough, hair loss. Uh, changes in smell and taste. Sometimes it's weird such as I have a family friend who reported that she can no longer smell her favorite perfume the same way after she contracted COVID and that was over a year ago. Some people report that the sense of smell is totally gone. Things don't uh, taste, taste the same. There's also paresthesias, which is basically an abnormal sen nerve sensation, such as tingling pins and needles. Um, I think you all had, had it when you accidentally kind of sleep on your arm overnight for a prolonged period of time, and you wake up and you're like, ooh, this feels terrible, like a burning sensation. That's a paresthesia. And uh, uh, they're hypothesizing that when COVID-19 is in the system, it triggers, of course, an inflammation cascade, and it's the inflammation process that attacks uh, the nerves, and this is what's called small fiber neuropathy. Now, when it comes to the mental health aspect, uh, the World Health Organization reported that in the first year of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and that's just the first year, we're not even talking about the second and soon to be third year, the global, global prevalence of anxiety and depression um, increased by a massive 25%. And this is probably underreported, um, and this is probably has to uh, be on the uh, depression and anxiety severity that probably needed psychiatric uh, treatment, meaning therapy and, and uh, medications. And of course, it's no surprise that people also started to self-medicate. Um, when there's stress and anxiety, you reach for whatever is available, and that was alcohol and tobacco. Um, there was about 25% of relapse rates uh, in patients who previously met criteria for abuse and addiction of nicotine and alcohol, and there has been also an increase in baseline use, meaning that even if you were social drinking, people tend to drink more. Now, I think this is going to be an interesting list because uh, anybody I talk to kind of affirmed that yes, these are the factors that impacted their own mental health. And of course there were a lot of external factors that resulted in the change in just how people felt. Um, there was of course the frequency and exposure uh, to individuals infected with the virus. Did you have to take care of a loved one who uh, contracted it? How did that impact you? Um, fear of infecting family members. When you tested positive, you're like, oh, grandma, I cannot come visit you, I don't want to infect you. 
Um, the lack of access to testing and medical care for COVID-19. I think we all remember seeing the long line of cars when everybody was desperate to get testing. There were not enough testing sites that added to everybody's uh, already um, stressful and anxious uh, mood. Uh, and of, this is without uh, a doubt that the home confinement and quarantining and uh, extended period of social isolation uh, where you had no one but, you know, yourself and probably the computer and the internet did impact people and uh, the feeling of loneliness and hopelessness set in. I think this was also one of the major ones that I, even with my colleagues, uh, we discussed it. The inconsistent messages and directives regarding public health measures such as wearing face masks. We, what kind of face masks? Do we wear it, not wear it? Um, vaccination, no vaccination. What are we doing? And I think we all remember at the very beginning, it was stay home, we're going to flatten the curve. And that was about the rough estimate of 14 days. Now, speed forward 800 days later, and with the inconsistent information, a lot of people are like, I can't even watch the news anymore. It, it makes me so upset. Uh, what is going on? We don't know. And, uh, you know, this inconsistent, the inconsistent messaging, I think, also impacted people's health and mental health. Um, increased workloads. Staffing shortages, uh, people staying home, testing positive, you can't come into work. That also impacted, I think, also in the, uh, the, in the hospitals where there are still shortages. So if you're uh, one of the ones working and you've got an increased workload, and continue to have increased workloads because staff shortages, that of course will impact everything before that we talked about. That was, of course, uh, the shortages of available resources, uh, such as toilet paper, which we all remember, people stacked up on. Uh, I'm not sure why, because this was not a gastroenteritis, but okay, we went with it. And I think uh, you could tell how people reacted to it. It's, I didn't think about buying toilet paper, paper, but what if they won't have it, because I see everybody stacking up on it. So that also was like a stressful situation. And going to the grocery store, standing in lines, what if they can't uh, fill up whatever is missing? And I think that we still have that the pandemic is still in the news, uh, it's still impacting everybody's lives one way or another. Um, and having said that, I think we, we are very much going to see more mental health needs as this drags on. And uh, that's pretty much what I have. Yeah, just to add into that, I, uh, so I, I'm a hospital-based physician, I'm an emergency physician, but I also am a first responder. I've been a uh, first responder since I was 17, um, and I respond out with the, uh, with the ambulances, the fire departments, the police departments, and you know, um, this has been a long-term disaster. So I mean, all of us remember, say, Hurricane Sandy. Extremely traumatic to all of us. Um, you know, I, I, I've been on the South Shore for a long time. You know, a lot of my friends and family were impacted, but that was a singular event. It happened, it lasted over uh, 20 hours, say, and then it was over. And then there was the there was the trauma of this event, and then the recovery, and the time it took us to recover. And some places are still recovering, but it was not an ongoing disaster. Like as as, as um, my colleague was saying, you know, this has been going 800 days or whatever. I mean. It, it, we're going on, you know, two, three years of this, and and it's it's still it's still impacting us, um, and especially first responders. You know, um, it was affecting all of us at you know in, in our family members. Like you, you, most of the time, you go to work. I go to the emergency department. You respond out on calls, and then you go home, and you're safe because you're you're getting away from your shift. You're getting away from your shift work. You're getting away from the, from the sick patients. You're getting away from the, the responding, and you get a chance to decompress before you go back out and, and, and again go to what you normally do. And in this disaster, there never was a break. Um, you know, as the town's physician, I can tell you that, you know, we were taking care of the town workforce and we were taking care of, you know, working on how we can figure out how to best, you know, help the public and, 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 and you know, our EMS uh, agency that, that I helped manage, we were looking, increasing public health and looking into keeping people safe and doing vaccinations. And so every day, it's just a, it, it, there is, there's never a break from this. It is it's a constant, um, you know, a constant disaster that we're dealing with. And I think 
something that all of us have to understand the effects it has on us. I mean, it's not a, you don't really get a, a vacation from this and it's still ongoing and we still, every time we think that, okay, it's finally over, oh, surprise, it's not over right now, we're now into variant BA.12345, I don't know, it, it, no, I'm joking, but, you know, it, there's, you know we, we keep getting these more variants and more variants that, that, that tend to be more infectious and every time we think we're getting ahead of this, it's still, it's still affecting us. So I think it's just, I think, uh, you know, as, as my colleague was saying, I think you have to recognize that, that we need to understand the effects this is having, give each other a chance to help each other out and, and get a little, and try to give yourself a break when you can because this is a very different situation that none of us experienced since, you know, Spanish flu in 1918, 1919. Yeah, so I mean, it's been, it's been that, that's probably the last time we faced anything of this magnitude, um, you know, here in the United States. So it's just, you know, it's been, it's just a once in a lifetime event and, and it just, it's going to continue to affect us and we really need to work together and, and you know, try to find a way to help each other, so. Absolutely. Do you guys have questions for us or is anything, um, we have a good panel of folks over here. We have, you know, I don't know if there's any, if there's any specific questions. We, last time we did this, there were, there were a lot of questions from the audience and it's a smaller audience this time. You guys want to hear us? All right, Doc, you got <laughs> Well, okay, so I guess I'll go over some of the medical effects. That's what I did last time. Um, being that I'm a cardiologist, um, I think a lot of people probably would know that COVID-19 does affect the heart. You know, you're probably hearing a lot about that. Um, obviously, it does affect the lungs, the pulmonary system. People get shortness of breath. But I think, um, you know, to speak plainly, that there is a virus that infects your body. Um, it can cause an inflammation for the body. Um, finding that it does affect the heart, it can affect the lungs, it can affect the brain, kidneys, other organ systems like the nerves in the body cause neuropathy. Um, so basically, if you have any of these symptoms, you should seek, you know, care from your doctor, your heart doctor, lung doctor, uh, any special doctor that can take care of these things. There is treatment for these type things. Um, so I just wanted to make you guys aware of that. But I won't go into details about it. I think maybe he has a few things on the other end to talk about social work and environments, right? Yes, yes, thank you. And, uh, thank you, Doctor, for your excellent presentation. Yeah. It was bringing back my own memories of uh, the supermarket and bringing the groceries home and washing them outside and being nervous to touch everything. Yeah, just all of that, you know, you know, trauma that we all went through, you know, we all have experienced the, you know, um, this trauma and a lot of us have other traumas uh, as well. But this was one that was collective around the entire world. Uh, there is a term for that, right? What is the, do you know the term? I'm, I'm, right now I'm not recalling, but there is a term for a trauma that's affected for everyone around the world. I just can't. I'm having the brain fog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to know what are some of the uh, solutions for the brain fog? Because <laughs> I think I have that before COVID, during, and after. So, so you know, so I, I, I can tell you, in, you know, so I, I had a, you know, I, I had a handout that I was gonna, you know, hand out to everyone, but I, I can hand it out afterwards. It's, you know, about mental health. What is mental health? And this is from the the uh, CDC, and and I think it's really good. It just answers like, you know, basic general questions that I think it's important for, you know, for everyone to know and, and have. And, and the doctor referenced that, you know, the, 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 the WHO report about the uh, pandemic triggers 25% increase in the prevalence of anxiety and depression, you know, worldwide. Um, and, and I believe that that's underreported also. And in, in the U.S., I know these numbers have, have gone down, uh, but it was 75%. Uh, of people in the United States, it increased uh, anxiety and 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 depression, um, and and now the whole world and all these countries they have to, uh, you know, if they had a survey they would include like what are they going to do about the mental health, psychosocial support, 
uh, related to their COVID-19 response. Like this has to be part of, you know, all the COVID-19 plans and, and response on how to, how to help people. And it created multiple, you know, stressors for people. And, and, and some of the worst hit from this WHO report, and I know I've seen it in my practice. I also work for a very large uh, state psychiatric hospital where I've been for uh, 20 years. And young people and women were worst hit by this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, and you know, and, and I, I have a 16-year-old and, and a 19-year-old, and I remember like what when the pandemic was first going on in 2020, and then throughout 2021. Uh, I know for myself, that's who I really felt bad for was the older people and the kids in school. Um, the things that they were missing uh, by being at home and in quarantine, quarantining, they, they weren't getting the education that they deserved, they weren't learning anything, and, and no one was prepared for this, so the schools weren't prepared. Um, so a lot of the, like, you know, the Zoom classes that they were doing, at least they had something but I know from my own kids and from their friends, there were all kinds of shenanigans going on with the kids and the teachers behind the scenes. And, and I know like I, I'd wake up at three or four o'clock in the morning and I'd hear noise in my son's room. Him and like 20 other kids are like playing these virtual video games together at like three or four o'clock in the morning on like a Tuesday. You know, and it was it. Was, and I was talking to the parents, thinking like, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm doing something wrong." But they, were, everyone I spoke to, they were all experiencing this. You know, me being a mental health professional, the doctors that I work with, the psychologists, most of the kids were all doing the same thing. And what's you know, it's what's kind of like what 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 i find too now is pete some people got so used to uh living in that isolated virtual world and, and some of them prefer it now um <clears throat> people didn't want to go back to work when it was time for them to go back to work and there was a mass exodus from the in-person work environment uh, and, you know, many of the kids didn't want to return to school. My, my daughter is away at school, thank God. She's, she just finished her first year of uh, college. And, um, and we were planning her, her schedule for, you know, next year going to our classes. And she told me that, and this was something that I just said, you know what, I can't believe this, but I do believe this. The first classes that um, that fill up the quickest, the classes that are hardest to get into while you're away at college, are the ones that you don't have to go to class for. The virtual classes where you could sit in your dorm room and do them. And I just like it, just like kind of like it, just really blew my mind. And I said, "You're not interested in those classes, are you?" And she said, "No, Daddy, I, I want to go." I, I, I want to go to school. There was a, a lot of other things that I printed out, how the pandemic uh, affected adolescents age 13 through 17. Um, you know, ways, ways to help and support your uh, children, family members, uh, different types of uh, cope, coping, coping techniques, and so I, you know, and I've also noticed that. So in my in my private practice, um, I primarily see people who have substance abuse problems. And and during the the uh, pandemic, there was a very high rate of relapse because their where they went for help if they were going to twelve step fellowship meetings, all of the Churches were closed down. 
Um, their counseling centers were closed down, and uh, and liquor stores remained open. You know, and 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 during that, you know, I'm also doing some other seminars with another group of people. Um, marijuana was becoming legal, um, so this is seems to be, you know, what the government was, you know, working on. Uh, while we're in a pandemic, and the mental health, substance abuse, pandemic, is the pandemic before the COVID-19 pandemic, and will continue to be the pandemic, uh, when and if, you know, COVID-19, it might not ever go away. Um, and, I, and, and all of the resources for people with mental health and substance abuse problems were shut down. And there was a lot of relapse. My job with the state at the psychiatric center, a, a lot of our patients who were in the outpatient environment, who was stable for decades, decompensated during the uh, Pandemic, they all the support that they were used to having, it just wasn't there any longer, and and we had many many suicides. Um, so this is definitely a a crisis. Um, we've all lived through it and have seen it firsthand. And uh, you know, and I I continue to sit like today. I was joking before. I just spent eleven hours at the uh, psychiatric center. Um, and the things that I see on a daily basis, and COVID has, has made the mental health and substance abuse crisis worse. Um, but there are, there are uh, people who, have, who, who are there to help. We're all here to help. There's many good uh, counseling programs out there, doctors, and, you know, so, so there, the, the help, thank God, has come back and is coming back. Um, so, uh, thank you all for uh, being here, and uh, you know it's my pleasure to serve on on this uh, panel with the other members. And I don't know if anybody has any questions for me or for anyone else. Thank you. Any questions for me, guys? That I can talk about? Questions, comments, anything? Just enjoying listening. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna, I would just like to, to uh, just follow up on that. But first off, I have to apologize. As a first responder, my phone goes off to tell me when there's a call to respond to. And even though my phone's on silent, it breaks through because you don't want to miss a call. So my, my team is out responding to a call right now. So I apologize if my phone went off. I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to be rude to anybody. But that's, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the current technology, that's the easiest way for us to get notified. So you don't ever want to miss if somebody needs something. So uh, my team's handling it. You don't have to worry. But uh, I just didn't want you to think I wasn't. Uh, Involved in taking care of you guys here tonight. So, uh, but just to follow up on, on what um, you know, what my friend here was saying, um, two things. Uh, you know, we've been uh, we've had a very robust um, uh, Narcan program from the town of Hempstead with Council of Esposito for for many years, two three years now, probably longer. Um, and obviously, that I, that I um, I help out the councilman with this. The town's position and our and our team supports him. And um, you know, we you know, like you were saying, the pandemic, uh, the original pandemic before this was 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 substance abuse and opioid abuse. And I mean, that was a really and we were actually starting to win that that battle. Like we were doing really good. The numbers were going down, and we were seeing you know you know at its peak, it was it was killing more people than we saw that died from HIV and, and some other um, you know medical epidemics. And that's why it had been such a big deal. Um, and then when COVID hit, um, as you were mentioning, you know, everyone went, you know, everyone became isolated, you lost your support structure, and, and you know, and the, and the opioid crisis, you know, blocked, it exploded, and then no one was really talking about it because the, the, the news was all about COVID, and it was basically COVID all the time, and so now, unfortunately, we're playing catch up on all of that, um, and, you know, we, you know, the town has given out, you know, we're, we're past our 10,000th Narcan kid, I think we're, we're, we're pushing 11 or 12,000 kids or something at this point, but I mean, you know, and unfortunately, we've had to now, you know, redouble our efforts now that we can all meet again and talk and 
and get this done. I mean, unfortunately, that you know we're still fighting. There are lots of other things. Um, you know, as an emergency physician, it was the oddest thing ever when the pandemic originally hit because the only thing we were seeing in the hospital were COVID patients. Like we weren't seeing heart attacks, we weren't seeing strokes, we weren't seeing diabetic emergencies. Like where do these things go? Like it's just like people were so afraid during those first you know first couple weeks and months. They they like they were ignoring other medical problems that suddenly were not showing up to us in the emergency department, and it was completely bizarre. And and then you know, and then, then after that, we said all these people coming back with all these chronic issues. I mean, it was it was it was really wild for the, for the period of time that like we just didn't see these things. And then it came back even worse. So I mean, then on top of this, now we're we're still fighting COVID, and now we have all these people. And I'm sure Doc and you guys have seen. You know, now now we have all these people were ignoring these chronic issues for so long, and now all of a sudden we're dealing with a double problem because we're trying to catch up on all these things that we kind of lost out on. So to add to the substance abuse component, I think. Uh you will find this interesting, or at least I hope. Um, in the hospital I work at, and also where I moonlight in other hospitals, we, for the past year to 14 months or so, we had some, uh, a lot of admissions for just fluid psychosis and agitation. And what we found out is, in the last 12 to 14 months, there has been lace marijuana that was sold. And it was laced with additives that nobody really knew what they were. And uh, I, I inquired about it and we found out that the supply chain crisis also impacted uh, you know, the drug market. Uh, they were not able to get the supply of the marijuana. So there were supplements added to it to uh, make sure that the weight was there. There they were additives that nobody knew about. It could have been, you know, any sort of detergent or um, special K, which was, you know, K2, anything that basically maintained the profit margin because it is a business. Um, it, it, it's gotten to the point where we have to basically tell people is uh, one, some of it was fentanyl based and we did see some patients coming in with respiratory depression needing to be intubated and admitted to the ICU and they were under the impression they just bought just plain weed or they came out and not remember what happened in the preceding several days and it was for psychosis, aggressive behavior to the point that they needed stem medication, they needed to be restrained and they had no recollection of the event. So this also permeated in what you're able to buy on the street and uh, we told people to exercise caution because uh, there has been these uh, incidents and as I said, even the chain of supply that previously was established how the drugs came in were disrupted and to maintain the profit margin they started to add other stuff inadvertent uh, and it was inadvertent ingestion to whoever bought it but we have had some pretty serious um issues with that yeah even previous to covid the fentanyl yeah um because fentanyl was able to be very easily imported from other countries right. um, the, uh, and, and fentanyl can be made very cheaply, and then it lasts it's so much stronger than all the other drugs. It actually can be lasted so much longer, so their profit margin is much larger on that. Mm -hmm. They were already making it look like other things, Xanax, Percocet. You know, unfortunately, there's no there's no quality control to something you're buying. You know, you know, not from a you know legitimate source. So you know, like you said, I mean, the the, the, the uh, overdose is a really big problem. Is is exposure to fentanyl, and then um, and then also people that um, you know go through a rehab facility and then they, they lose their tolerance and then they get exposed again. And then, right. again, that was the big problem. Like you were mentioning, like all of their all of their usual, um, you know, support structures did suddenly weren't there anymore. Like, you know, you weren't seeing people, you could meet with people. I mean, until we figured out Zoom and even that, you know, so that, that's a huge problem, yeah. And there was issues with the closure of the methadone clinics and the Suboxone prescription. That's right. So that was also contributed to the relapses. The, the other presentations that I'm also uh, very lucky to be involved with with the town of Hempstead are the legal does not mean safe and we go over all these different topics about marijuana and other drugs. And that's where council in D'Esposito does the uh, Narcan training. So I've sat in a, you know, a, quite a few of these, uh, not just years ago, but recently because every week I'm at one of these uh, seminars and he's giving the Narcan training. There's, there's a young man that I've been bringing around with me and he also speaks. He's 16 years old and he's sober for 
uh, nine months, and he talks about, you know, how he started on marijuana and where all that led to, and then goes into his recovery story. But I'm sitting next to him, and I'm saying, you know, in all these years that I've been in this field, um, I, I've never uh, witnessed someone, you know, being uh, Narcan, is that the correct word? So someone being revived by Narcan. And he says, well, you haven't? He says, I've seen it at least 20 or 30 times. And I was like, where? Where did you see this? And he said, at school. You know, so really very, very scary what's going on out there. I know when I was going to high school, there were drugs and alcohol around, but I, I, there was no one being narcan or, you know, overdosing in the bathroom or in the parking lot where we, we were witnessing it. So it is a, it's, it's a different world out there today with these sort of fentanyl and these drugs. Kids are experimenting for the first time. They're not addicts drinking in a park, convinced to try a pill, and they're dying. You know, they're not alcoholics or drug addicts. And, and even smoking, you know, pot that has fentanyl and trying it for the first time, just like how I know I did and many other people did. But, you know, these days there's other substances in it and there are teenagers and kids 12, 13 years old trying it for, trying pot for the first time and dying, you know. So I know the way I educate my kids, don't smoke anything, don't take anything, and, um, you know, because this is what's going going on out there. Um, it's very scary and, and very sad. And it is, I heard on the news the other night, uh, it, our, our, our children are being poisoned, you know, they're, they're, and they are where these drugs are being made in Mexico and China and making their way here, they're, you know, they're, they're poisoning our youth. So in addition to all these mental health problems related to, you know, COVID-19 and shutdowns and lockdowns, um, and even the problems before that, um, you know, now there's also this and there was that. So it's, um, you know, a lot of help is needed out there. So I just wanted to, and, and the suicides, even when I was growing up, I don't, I can't even remember one kid who committed suicide. Um, you know, I, I'm 52, so I really, I grew up in like the late 70s and, and the 80s. I graduated high school in 88. And, and like today, my kids know so many kids their age who've committed suicide. So it is, you know, uh, there a lot of help is needed. So they, this room should be packed with people. Thank you. Yeah, and just uh, along the lines of other things that we were dealing with before COVID, um, you know, vaping is a very big problem. Um, you know, what the town was working on a, a program trying to give people the, the idea, the understanding of how dangerous that is. I mean, it's essentially a nicotine delivery device, and, and, and unfortunately, the kids are getting exposed to it and don't realize it's not like a cigarette. I mean, like, it's, it's literally designed to, I mean, and it tastes good. It takes away all of the bad things, right? It's, it doesn't smell bad, it doesn't taste bad. Um, you can hide it very easily. I mean, there was, that, was a, that was also something that we were dealing with that, you know, kids had access to. That unfortunately, that there's so many things now that it's so, it's so different than like when we all grew up. And, and, you know, that, you know, and then also just like COVID just derailed all of this stuff. So, I mean, there's just so many layers of, 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 this, of this onion of, of what's affecting our, you know, all sorts of different populations and the challenges everyone's facing. And this is why, you know, discussing this kind of stuff and mental health is such a big deal now because it's just so many things that either got, you know, derailed or changed or, you know, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That it's just, it's just, you know. I mean, I mean, you know that the last time we did this, the one guy who gave a question goes, "Why is everyone driving so crazy?" Like you just notice it, like when you're out in the street, like the, the stress level of everyone is so high. Like you know, you're out driving, like literally, like and you know, I, I know, actually know someone who was a tow truck operator. He's one of the fire chiefs, and he's a tow truck operator, and he's the busiest he's ever been because of all the crashes. Like he says, literally, like like he's never had business like this. I mean, you wouldn't think about those things, but just because of the, the unfortunately, the level of stress, and then people take it out on road rage, and I mean, it's just. There's, it's, this is why we want to be talking about this stuff and giving you guys resources because there's just so there's just so many layers here of things that we need to deal with that just just, just got derailed by the, the the pandemic, you know, medical and, and mental and physical.
Any other questions from you guys? <laughs> or any question? <laughs>
our gut has more serotonin receptors than our brain. So it's actually called our second brain. And I'm glad that you asked that question because studies have consistently shown in literature and it's making a comeback now that everybody has or experienced depression or anxiety one way or another that what we put in our body and what we eat greatly influences our mood. Fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, I'm a, a very much of a proponent, cook your own meals, um, the, for free you can have, even on YouTube, cooking uh, uh, lessons, even how to chop something, how to dice something, uh, you know, foods on a budget, whole foods and vegetables, raw fruit, nothing for example in heavy syrup that people like in cups, fresh fruits fresh vegetables. Um, hydration status is very important. Uh, I'm a big proponent of water. Sometimes it's hard to drink water, it's boring, I know. Uh, squeeze some lemon or lime juice like in it. Uh, you know the seltzer? No yes, <laughs> seltzer waters are pretty good, that comes with some natural flavorings, go down easier. Um, herbal teas, rosehip, hibiscus, uh, any natural low caffeine teas. You can go to Home Goods Marshalls, they have the best price. I'm not affiliated with Home Goods Marshalls. Uh, make yourself a big pitcher of hot tea, let it cool, add to it some ice, regular water, and that's your iced tea. It's cheaper, it's nothing on a shelf that sits there for two years that uh, you, you drink. Um, so as natural as you can make it. Um, vitamin D has been shown to be low on patients, especially in the state psychiatric center when they did the vitamin D levels, uh, almost everybody was low, so that has been associated with uh, mood. Easiest thing, go out into the fresh air, sit, especially if there's sun, do something for 15 and 20 minutes outside. Walk around, uh, brisk steps fresh air, sunlight, um, basically back to nature in a way. Uh, fish having uh, omega fatty acids, sardines, mackerel, salmon, um, has been known to also impact mood. Some people take the cod liver oil supplement, not that great of a flavor. Uh, so if you can uh, eat it in the natural form, uh, that's great. Um, supplements, I say if you can eat uh, a wholesome diet, there is less need for outside supplementation. But as I said, raw fruits and vegetables, the green leafy vegetables, the fibrous vegetables, um, fruit, uh, and I know this is also a budget issue, uh, organic foods because uh, there, there is less uh, pesticides associated with it has have made an impact. For example, uh, regular apples, they have the beautiful sheen, uh, it's very attractive. That sheen is actually a thing called a wax. And wax is basically hydrophobic, meaning it hates water. So even if you wash it, it doesn't wash off. So non-organic apples, you would have to technically uh, take off the peel, right? Because whatever's on it, you would ingest it. So these little nuances uh, that you know nobody really talks about or teaches us. Um, there are a lot of free information out there. If you just do an internet search, you know, mood boosting foods, mood boosting recipes, uh, cognitive, uh, have like brain fog diet, stuff like that, and it's for free. Uh, they have an amazing amount of data and information out there. And I think that's uh, And I would just say the two, two things along those lines. One, when you get stressed, the processed foods and what makes you happy. I mean, there's actually a, like a little connection like with, with sugar and stuff that you, it actually it releases serotonin and dopamine right. in the brain and makes you feel uh, good. And so, I mean, that, that's why when you are stressed, a lot of times you go and you end up eating things that are not healthy for you because it makes you in the short term feel better. But in the long term, it's, it's affecting right. you both physically and mentally. So, I mean, that's that's a really big thing of like stress eating. I mean, that is a thing. Um, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, it's really hard. And, and um, I worked for many years in Philadelphia. I, did, I, I, I spent uh, more than 10 years in inner city Philly uh, working in hospitals there, helping out um, underserved communities. And it's very hard because the, the foods that you're mentioning are expensive, right. uh, especially now with inflation. Like, it is, it is really hard to eat healthy because it's really expensive. The, the processed stuff is the cheap stuff. And unfortunately, that also affects, so that, that, that's, a, that's a factor that 
that's affected, and that's that's a big that's a big public health issue that's been not a lot to, you know not discussed a lot, but 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 should be understood that that's also part of the challenge. That, you know, especially now with the price of everything going up. Yes, and there's definitely uh, the the food and new component, and there's a lot of books out there such as our reading, our feelings, and to put it simply, birthday parties have cake and ice cream because it makes people happy. If you serve like you know some raw vegetable platter, it would be not happy at a birthday party. But and you know it is true, and not just the, the cost of such food, but the access to it and transportation. Um, because you do, if you don't have a car, how are you going to get to the store? Where you we would have to take two buses to access that fresh foods and, and uh, healthy stuff. So definitely, there are some uh, limitations of uh, how you can get and who can get nutrition. Any other questions? We appreciate that you're all here. Thank you very much again on behalf of the supervisor and the, and the council, the, the council folks, uh, the council uh, members. We, we appreciate you guys are here. Um, this is a really good resource. Please don't hesitate. If, if after you leave here, you guys have any questions, you can reach out to Senior Council of Lucy's office. Um, I'll have my part. If anyone needs it, I can give you access to uh, to our medical team. Um, and you know, you can always go on the town's website and get information. And if you email them, they, they will answer. There's a, there's a whole team of people, and if it's a medical question, they'll refer it over to me, and then I can reach out to these folks. Um, and we'll be here for anyone afterwards if you guys want to talk to us offline if it's not something you feel uncomfortable in a big group. But thank you very much. We, thank you so much for coming. And, and you know, best of luck. I hope everyone does well and uh, you know stays healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.